All right, well, please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We're done with James. It was a great journey, but now we're going to begin this journey in the book of Luke. And Christmas is getting close. Uh, this year, uh, it just feels like we need to get back to something that uh, we can count on, something that's familiar in these strange times. I mean, for most of us, this has been, for sure, the strangest year in our lifetimes. Almost no area of, of life and community has been untouched um, in some way by this pandemic. No matter where you stand on the issues, our lives have been impacted. But Christmas is the annual opportunity that we get to do some things we can count on. Um, some things that we're familiar with. We sing the same songs, we tell the same stories. Uh, most of us put up the same decorations every year. And um, because, you know, apart from the gift that you might give or the gift you might receive, Christmas is not about something new. Christmas is really all about something timeless, a hope that doesn't change in a world that is constantly changing. Well, this Christmas... We have really good news, and we don't need a new message. We need the same message, the, the right message, and that message is the gospel. It's the remedy for our greatest need in every generation, in every place, in every circumstance, um, but we need to be reminded. Um, so my promise this Christmas season is to tell you nothing new. All right. I want us to remember the same amazing, wonderful message of Christmas. But what might be surprising, or maybe even new, is how relevant this message is to what you are experiencing even right now in these strange times. So I'm excited for the next three weeks, Luke 1 and 2, we're going to spend in those chapters uh, texts that are jam-packed with historical accounts that inform much of what we know about the first Christmas. And uh, it's interesting that we have four Gospels in your Bible, uh, four books that specifically tell details about the life and ministry of Jesus. And it's a fair question to ask, well, why are there four books? Why do we have four uh, different authors writing the story about Jesus' life and ministry. Well, maybe in part, it's just such an amazing and important story. Uh, each book has a slightly different perspective, maybe even a slightly different audience. But uh, why don't we just let Luke tell us why he wrote this book, because that's what he does in the first four verses. So if you've got your Bible in front of you, let's look at Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Okay, so obviously Luke knows other people had written this story down. Why did he also write a book? Well, he says right there in verse 4, to help us have certainty concerning the things we have been taught. Wasn't that great? Um, but it's still going to require faith to believe the story because we can't see it. We can't prove it. Um, that's true for anything in history. So don't treat the Bible stories any differently than you would necessarily from other historical accounts. Um, how do you know that something happened? How do you have certainty? I mean, there were eyewitnesses. Obviously, there were people who wrote those things down, what happened. Uh, there were others who saw it, and they confirmed what was written, and so they wrote about it. 
But eventually, all the people who saw something in history died. Um, And our certainty of how do we know that's what actually happened is based on faith. It's based in the credibility, the accuracy of those who wrote down what happened, and that requires faith. Any student of history is a person of faith. Um, But just because you didn't see it doesn't mean your certainty about those events is blind faith. So, So here's our big idea as we launch into this Christmas message. It's without faith, it is impossible to live. Without faith, it's impossible to live. That's true for every person on the planet. Everyone has faith in something. Even the atheist who says there is no God. That's a statement of faith. They can't prove that. So don't be fooled by someone who says, well, I live by science or reason. I don't live by faith. That's not possible. Um, They're not being honest with you or with themselves. So Luke is about to share some details about what we have come to call the Christmas story. And he wants you to have certainty about the things that you've been taught. Well, since the time of Luke, uh, the Christmas message has gotten a little messy. Um, If you haven't noticed, uh, it's not about... Christmas trees or decorations. Nothing wrong with those. We enjoy them, but that's not what Christmas is about. Uh, Definitely not about Santa. Um, uh, That's probably not super helpful for the Christmas story. But again, not wrong. It's not about us giving gifts to others. Um, That's not part of the Bible story or the message. Uh, But perhaps the biggest surprise, Christmas is not about us deciding we need to get serious about seeking God. Oh, come let us adore him. Okay, we sing that song, which is fine. But the real story of Christmas, the one that we read in our Bible, is about how God broke through and sought us. God reached out to us. Um, And he continues to reach out to us. And in these stories that we're going to be reading, he sends his messengers. Uh, Who are God's messengers? Do you know? Angels. Uh, These angels go ahead of him to deliver the good news that he is on the move, that he's doing something. So our series over the next few weeks is When God Speaks. Uh, The question is, will you be listening? Um, How will we respond? Will we believe? And and Luke, as he writes this account, he wants this person named Theophilus. We really don't know who he is. Um, He wants him to have certainty. And it's been included in our Bible because God wants all of us to have certainty. But it's still going to require faith. Um, God wants to grow your faith. And in our text today, which is kind of a pre-Christmas story about the birth of John the Baptist, we're going to see some ways that he does that. So let's let's pray and ask God to speak and that we will listen. Lord, thank you for your word that doesn't change. Thank you that we can come back to these stories that are not just stories. Um, These are historical accounts of when you broke through to seek us out. Thank you for the faithful people who wrote these things down, uh, especially Luke this morning, so that we could have certainty. So God, help us to hear from you whatever the message is that you have for us today and help us to believe in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so when God speaks, the question today, will you believe in Hebrews 11.6? Uh, that's a verse you're familiar with, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But as we said in our big idea, without faith, it's impossible to live. 
So three ways that God grows our faith, as we see in the text today, our faith is stretched when we are waiting on God. Our faith is stretched when we are waiting on God. He grows our faith during seasons of waiting, waiting on him, waiting for an answer, uh, waiting for a provision. Uh, Some of us are in a place of waiting right now, so you can relate. And that's the kind of season that Zechariah and Elizabeth had been in for a long time. So let's pick up the story in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Proverbs 13, 12 uh, says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, um, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Um, Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. Um, They had no children. And uh, there was a hope that was deferred there. So what we see in the story is, uh, um, what what are you going to do? What do we do? How do we respond when first righteousness goes unrewarded? I mean, we think it's hard to live for God in today's culture. We we have no idea about hard. Uh, There's a phrase right there in our text. Verse 5, it says, in the days of Herod. Okay, you just gloss over that. But that actually meant something to those who knew what it was like. When they heard the name King Herod, it meant really bad, wicked, evil, tyrant. Okay, this is the guy who would kill all the boys in Bethlehem two years old and younger uh, because the wise men told him about the birth of another king. And it's in this difficult world where these two very devout people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were trying to live for God. Verse 6 says right there, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commands and statutes of the Lord. Uh, Would anybody say that about us? Would anybody say that about you? I mean, that's some serious good living. And that's not easy to do. Not easy to live that way back then. It's not easy to live for God today. But when you make those choices to say, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to live for God, and you begin swimming upstream, because that's what it feels like. Nobody else around me is doing this. I'm all alone. Um, and you're doing that all the time, eventually this is what happens. You get tired. And you say, is this getting me anywhere? Um, And you begin to do a cost-benefit analysis in your head, and you start to wonder, is it really worth it for me to put in all this effort uh, to live righteously and blamelessly? Um, You see, when, when righteousness over time essentially goes unrewarded, it stretches your faith. So I don't know for you, is is there anything in your life right now, a hope that's being deferred? Uh, You're waiting on God. You know, for Elizabeth, it was infertility, um, hoping for a job, hoping for a spouse, hoping for a friend, an answer, provision. Waiting can make the heart sick. It can stretch your faith. Uh, But there's another way it's stretched. Um, What will you do when faithfulness goes unrewarded? Look at verses 8 to 10. Now, while Zechariah was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside. 
at the hour uh, outside at the hour of incense. Um, well, it would have been easy, I think, for, for Zechariah and Elizabeth after all these years just to say, you know, uh, it's not worth it. Okay, God, we're, we're not going to serve you anymore. We've been doing this for a long time, not until you come through for us. Um, but they didn't do that. They kept working for God while they were waiting for God. Um, Zechariah didn't put his life on hold. He didn't say, all right, God, when you give me what I'm asking for, then I will serve you. He didn't do that. But his faith must have been stretched. Uh, I imagine he woke up every day with the pain of this unfulfilled desire, this hope that was being deferred, uh, this living righteously and faithfully that had not been rewarded yet. And verse 7 just says what the pain was right there. They had no child. That was the pain. What's your pain? What, uh, what are you waiting on God for right now? Is it stretching your faith? Um, is it putting off your hope? I mean, we all go through this in seasons, but perhaps the biggest trial is the next one. When time goes by and nothing happens. Okay, what does it say at the end of verse 7? Both were advanced in years. And then in verse 18, Zechariah responds to the angel. We're going to get to it. But he says, I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. He just sort of lost hope that they would ever have a child. Their faith had been stretched for so long, but they stayed faithful. They continued to live for God. They kept praying. They kept serving. They kept hoping. What do we call that at Compass? Rowing the boat. They just kept rowing the boat. And some of you are in that kind of a space right now. And let's just be honest. It's hard. Yeah, it can make the heart sick. Um, but here's the assurance we can have. God hears you. He loves you. He has a plan. And uh, even if you're old like Zechariah, if you're not dead, you're not done. I haven't said that in a while. Um, God's ways are not man's ways. God's timing is not man's timing. And uh, this may not be what you need to get into a Christmas spirit, but this may be what you really need to hear. And in our story, it's about to get better. Okay, waiting is hard. It's going to stretch our faith. But when God answers, we need to be ready because actually when God answers, it can test our faith. So God wants to grow our faith. So our faith is actually tested when God answers us. And we kind of just blew by this fact as you read in, in uh, Luke 1. But this was probably the biggest day of Zechariah's life. Um, there were thousands of priests. I think there were at least 18,000 priests that were assigned uh, some sort of duty. Um, and they took turns serving at the temple 24-7. It was a 24-7 thing, and they took turns serving at the temple. But they had to cast lots, it says, kind of like throwing dice to see who would actually enter the holy place of the temple to light the incense and to uh, do some duties in there. You might serve as a priest your entire life and never get chosen for this opportunity. It was not guaranteed. But Zechariah gets chosen. Okay, you might think, well, was he lucky? No. It's not by chance. We read in Proverbs 16, 11, it says this, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So for whatever reason, they actually would throw dice. They, they cast a lot to see who would do this. We don't do this today to determine God's will. Okay, if it's, if it's heads, it must be God's will. If it's tails, it's not. We don't do that. Right? We have the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us. But what hasn't changed here even when they threw the lot, God was in control. 
of every opportunity. He was in control of whatever opportunities come our way. There's no such thing as coincidences. God is at work in his time and in his way. So when your time comes, the lot gets cast your direction, the opportunity comes your way, um, are you looking? Are you, are you ready? Are you anticipating in faith? Okay. Sometimes when you wait for a long time, your faith gets stretched. Um, but when God answers, it will actually test your faith. Let's look what happens to Zechariah. First, um, God tests him with his presence. Look at verse 11 and 12. So Zechariah is serving in the temple. He's lighting the incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So Rodney and Dylan, as you're up there lighting the candle, it's like somebody suddenly appears next to you as you're lighting the candle. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. That would freak you out, wouldn't it? Um, and fear fell upon him. All right, so this was a big nervous moment for Zechariah. You know, he, this is the first time in his life, maybe he didn't even know anybody else who had, had gotten the opportunity to do this. He was out of his comfort zone. There were all these people, it says, outside uh, praying, maybe praying for Zechariah, hope he gets it right. You know, there was a lot of pressure on him as he entered the temple. I hope I don't mess up. And as he's in there doing this, right there in front of him appears an angel. It must have been amazing. You probably could have heard a pin drop. And Zechariah has two responses. It says, first, he's troubled. Then it says, he's afraid. See, when God starts to work, when God begins to provide an answer in your life, it will often rock your world. It will change you know, the situation such that um, you have these two responses. First, he was troubled. Okay, it's this feeling that, wait a minute, everything's getting out of control. I'm losing my grip. I'm not sure what to do here. Now, if you haven't noticed, God kind of likes to get you in that situation. Um, it tests your faith. The question is, will you run away? Will you run away or will you run to him? Then it says next in the text that fear fell upon him. Okay, that's a natural response in the presence of God. When God shows up and we're like, ah, oh, oh, you're God, I'm not. You're awesome, I'm not. We feel small, we feel weak, we feel vulnerable. Uh, there's, there's fear, but there's a part of that kind of fear that's okay. Um, it's actually a good place to be, but to embrace it, to expect it, and then to be ready for what's next. He's going to test you with his comfort. In verse 13, the angel said to him, I mean, he's freaked out. He can see Zechariah's face is turning white. He says, hey, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Do not be afraid. Pretty much every time God's presence is revealed to someone in the Bible, God is answering their prayer. He's calling them to a mission. And what do they do? They fall down in fear, as they should, and then God or the angel says what to them? Do not fear. Do not be afraid. He has you in a vulnerable place where you're dependent on him. Uh, and here's what he wants to do in that moment where you are, you've, you've fallen down, you're afraid, you're vulnerable. This is, this is what God wants to do. This, this is what he doesn't want to do. He doesn't want to crush you. What does he want to do? He wants to give you comfort. Um, have you ever experienced that? 
you were in a dark valley. You were going through a difficult situation. You were vulnerable, afraid. And God's presence came around you, gave you comfort, uh, the peace that passes understanding. Um, if you're in a vulnerable place right now, I long for you to experience and know that comfort. But here's what we have to do. This is the hard part. You ready? You have to linger. You have to linger in that scary place for a moment or two. I mean, Zechariah is in the temple getting ready to light and an angel appears. And here's what he could have done. Drop the incense holder and bolt for the door. You won't believe what happened in there. Okay? But he lingered. He, he waited. Um, his faith was tested. He was afraid. He was troubled. But because he lingered, what happened? He was comforted. I mean, what would have happened if he had ran? <laughs> Some of us do that, you know. First scary thing, out! Well, he would have missed something. Um, he would have missed something very significant. So here's the question. Do you run when you hit that scary place, when life is out of control, when, when there's fear and feeling small in God's presence, it just overwhelms you, don't run. Linger. Don't miss what God has next for you, which is pretty much always comfort. Because that's often when he reveals his provision and his plan. Um, he tests you uh, with his presence, with his comfort, and then he tests you with his provision and his plan. So let's read verses 13 to 17 and see what the angel had to say to him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, this is actually very interesting. Names back in that day actually meant something, not like today. I think a lot of us name uh, our kids because uh, it's just kind of a cool baby name. You know, uh, when our son was born, I kind of liked the name Boaz. I thought that was a cool name. I didn't know any other Boazes. But uh, we chose Hunter, okay, but not because it had meaning. We just thought, oh, that's kind of a cool name. But names back in, in the Bible days, and still in a lot of cultures, they actually had meaning. So Zechariah actually means something. It means God remembers. Okay, Zechariah means God remembers. Elizabeth has a meaning. It means God, my promise. Right? And John means God has been gracious. So when you said these names uh, back in the Bible day, when they said Zechariah, it was actually you were saying God remembers. Um, when you said Elizabeth, you were saying God my promise. And John, you were saying God has been gracious. So, so this is what the angel told Zechariah. Put it on the screen because maybe it's hard to translate in your head. But just replace the name Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John with its meaning. This is what the angel was telling Zechariah. Do not be afraid, God remembers, for your prayer has been heard, and God, my promise, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name. God has been gracious. That's pretty cool. How long do you think Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for a child? A long time. Um, 
their faith had been stretched as they were waiting. Um, but when had their prayer been heard? Probably right away. I mean, it, the prayer may have been heard 20, 30, 40 years earlier, but the time was not yet right for the answer. So what did they have to do? They had to wait. Are you in that spot right now? Okay, you've been praying for something for a long time, but there's no answer. Don't lose hope. But when God brings an answer, will you be ready? Are you listening? Does he have your attention? Does he have your dependence on him? So this Christmas, let's not lose hope as we're waiting. Let's be looking. Let's be listening for God's messenger, his presence, his comfort, his provision. Make sure you linger if you're in a hard spot there and it's scary and you want to get out. I don't want you to run and miss what God has for you. We miss so much because we run. Or we're not anticipating in faith. We're, we're just not listening. And when the answer comes, here's what happens. We don't embrace it. Um, God wants to grow our faith. And, and how we grow really depends on our response to his messenger to his message, to his provision. So this is the third way God grows our faith in our story here. Our faith is renewed when God's grace is embraced. Right? Our faith is renewed when God's grace is embraced, when we actually believe him, okay, when we trust him, we embrace his plan. And that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, it's going to require faith um, because belief um, and it requires belief because God tends to do things in a way that makes it obvious he's the one doing the work. It's not us. I mean, every Bible story, just start naming them. Joshua, here's what I want you to do. Go take the city. Yeah, that's what we thought, God. No. He says, go march around the city seven times and then shout. What? Really? Um, Gideon, you've got a nice strong army here. I want you to send them all home. I want you to just keep 300 of them. Uh, and by the way, here's what I want you to go to battle with. Clay pots, torches, and trumpets. I mean, Gideon's like, can I please keep my sword? Nope. Don't need it. Okay, Moses, uh, go tell Pharaoh, most powerful man in the world, to let my people go. <laughs> God, you don't just walk in and say that. To the Pharaoh. Um, okay, well then do this. Lead my people to the Red Sea, hold your staff over the waters, and then pass through the sea. Oh, this could get really awkward if it doesn't work. Um, Zechariah, your wife shall bear you a son in your old age. You'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Believe me, to Zechariah, that sounded just as crazy as any of those other things God told people before to do. God sent his messenger. Zechariah's prayers were answered in that moment, but embracing God's grace was going to require faith. Because life requires faith. And it seems like Zechariah wasn't quite there. Zechariah wasn't quite there. And this lack of faith had a significant impact on his life, on his joy and his gladness. So um, we need to be aware of three things. First is the danger of unbelief. Let's see how this plays out starting in verse 18. Okay, so the angel appears to him, gives him this great message, and here's how Zechariah responds. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. How can I believe you? How can I trust you that what you're saying is true? Wow. The angel answered him. I can just see him tilting his head. I'm Gabriel. <laughs> you don't know who I am, do you? I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold. 
you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people outside, they were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple, what's taking him so long? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. I mean, Zechariah, you know, the angel speaks to him. He's like, wow, that (laughs) sounds good. But in case you didn't notice, angel, person, I'm a little old uh, for a child. And, and, the, and the angel knew, he didn't say he didn't believe, but the angel knew exactly what was going on in Zechariah's heart. And he says there in verse 20, you did not believe my words. Um, God was still going to fulfill his plan. He was going to give them this baby called God has been gracious. But there were going to be uh, consequences for Zechariah's unbelief. He didn't embrace God's grace and provision, so he was going to be silent He would not be able to speak for at least nine months. And we can infer uh, from verse 62 a little later that he was also deaf. It wasn't just that he couldn't speak. He couldn't hear either. Um, People had to make signs to him so that he could understand them. Zechariah was going to miss the full experience of what God was doing You see, you can choose not to believe God, but there are going to be consequences. There are losses. Uh, God's going to do what he's going to do anyway. The question is, are you going to experience um, what he's doing in the way he wants you to experience it? So we have to be aware of the danger of unbelief, but we also have to be aware of this, the wonder of God at work. Uh, Look at verses 24 and 25. Okay, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Okay, so again, Zechariah can't hear Elizabeth. He's like, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. You know, he can't hear the joy in her voice. He can't celebrate By shouting and singing, I can't believe after all these years my wife is pregnant. He can't hear. He can't sing. And then in verse 41, when Mary visits with with Jesus in her womb, look what happens uh, starting in verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. It's a party going on. What's Zechariah doing? Probably sitting in silence in the room next door, not hearing a thing. Everyone else was in wonder at what God was doing, but not Zechariah. But finally, nine months later, It's time for the baby to be born. Okay, so look at verses 57 to 59. Now, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. That would have made sense. But his mother answered no. He shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. It didn't make sense to them. All right, let's go ask Zechariah. So they made signs to his father, because he couldn't hear, inquiring, what do you want your child to be called? And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. Okay, even, even at birth, okay, in Zechariah's arms, he, he can't hear the baby cry. He can't hear all the rejoicing of the neighbors and the relatives over this. Um, 
His, his capacity to enter into the joy of what God was doing was, was diminished. Why? Because he didn't believe. He didn't embrace the grace of God's provision. How has God been gracious to you? We all have unanswered prayers. But what has he answered? Has he been gracious to you? You may feel that you've been living righteously or, or faithfully, uh, but it's been unrewarded. But has God still been gracious to you? You know, your capacity to, to feel and experience his blessing this Christmas, uh, to experience his joy and his gladness may be directly related to your willingness, your, your, your faith to embrace um, this message that, hey, God has been gracious to me. God has been gracious to me. Would, would you even dare just say that with me and believe it? God has been gracious to me. Say it again. God has been gracious to me. Um, don't be so focused on the what is yet to be that you don't rejoice in the fact that God has been gracious to you. All right, so Zechariah had a long time to think about this. He had nine months um, to think about the consequences of his unbelief. And so I imagine he was ready and he was not going to get it wrong a second time. So, so we have to be aware of the danger. We need to be aware of, of the wonder of what God is doing. But then third, we need to be aware of the joy of when we actually believe. So again, look, he comes to him. They ask him for his name. He writes it on a tablet. His name is John. They all wonder, verse 64, look what happens. Immediately, his mouth was opened, his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God, and fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. He says, The boy's name is John. It's the first time he's spoken in nine months. They're all just like, Whoa! Zechariah is speaking. God has been gracious. That's what he was saying when he said the name John. God has been gracious. For nine months he couldn't speak or hear. Every day he probably thought to himself, if I get the chance to speak again, I am not holding back. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to embrace what I wouldn't embrace. God has been gracious to me. The Lord has been gracious. His name is John. And what happened then? Oh, it just says the joy flowed. The gladness flowed. The people wondered. They were all in awe of what God was doing. After nine months, he didn't hold back. And you can read on your own there, Zechariah's prophecy, verses 67 to 80, some amazing prophetic words of what God was doing to save us. You see, without faith, it is impossible to live. It's impossible to please God. And God wants to grow your faith. Um, and in order to do that, Here's what happens sometimes. God stretches your faith by making you wait. Um, he tests your faith by giving you an answer and seeing how you will respond. Um, um, he'll give you his comfort. He'll give you his provision, his plan. But be looking, be listening, be ready. Because when he does and he reveals that to you, you don't want to miss his provision. So you want to believe. You want to embrace his plan. And if you do, and we're going to see this with Mary next week, because she did, you will grow, you will make progress, you will have joy, um, you will have gladness, you won't miss out. So, so if you're in that place of waiting, um, lingering, trusting him because it's scary, um, be patient. Be looking to him and never forget uh, about 
how he has already been gracious to you. And then your heart will be ready. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for um, telling us this story about how you sent your messenger to Zechariah. And Lord, thank you that you worked out your plan, even though Zechariah didn't believe at first. At least he didn't run. So God, we can take some hope in that for us. There's a hope that we have that we've been praying for for a long time. We've been serving faithfully. We've been walking faithfully. We've been swimming upstream. But it just feels like we're not making any progress. Lord, give us strength to not give up. Help us to keep rowing the boat of faithfulness. And help us to be ready. Give us the faith that we need that when you do show up in ways that you reveal your plan and your provision for us, that we will have faith to believe you. Um, so God, thank you for your amazing grace. The grace that it took to become a child, to become a baby. That's God's riches at Christ's expense. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. It's amazing grace. We want to adore you this Christmas. We want to see through all of the distractions and remember what Christmas is really all about, how you came and sought us out.